Preparing to do magic. Oh, it reverted back to you. There we go. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, that's a nice face. <laughs> okay. So that should, should do it. Be able to come from here. Right. And we should be able to go to. Yeah. It shouldn't be. Then you can share your screen. Just, to... I do want to mute that so we don't get. But weren't we, isn't one of the problem last time that no, we did? The, 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 I'm going to mute the YouTube. Uh, the, otherwise, we'll, we'll hear the, like the echo, basically. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's your dog. It's good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now we just need to get it on the. Now I need to inject that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now I just need to go <laughs> here, and we need to go. Uh, yeah, it's that weird thing with like each projector needs to be. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Good. That looks like it's working. Yes. Yeah, so I'm all right. Running. Okay, and right on time. Nice. But whenever you're ready. Yeah, I'll do it minute minute ish, but yeah. <laughs> One, two, one, two, all right, that's going to work a little better, we'll do that. All right, everybody, well, I guess we're, uh, we'll get going for everyone who's here so we can uh, get everybody home before it gets dark. Right, because <laughs> it hasn't been for four hours. Uh, welcome to the last installment of our Unearthing uh, the Bible series. Over the past um, five, uh, four sessions, we've uh, tried to been looking uh, looking at the role that uh, archaeology, ancient texts, ancient culture studies uh, can play in helping us better understand biblical texts, try to put them into their historic setting. So we kind of did a basic overview in week one, and then since that, we've been looking at specific cases studies, looking at figures like Noah, Abraham and Sarah, Moses and Joshua. And today we'll be continuing with David and Solomon, getting into the foundations of the um, Israelite monarchy, two of our better known uh, figures from the Bible in popular culture, uh, and particularly even in uh, art. And so we have some of our uh, wonderful uh, European medieval Renaissance uh, style paintings and sculptures, again, hearkening back to this particular period. Uh, but what can you say about this period? Well, first we wanna sort of take us from where we were into where we are now. So when uh, we left uh, each other after the last meeting a few weeks ago, we had just been looking at this uh, biblical account of Joshua and the conquest, right? So we were asking the question of where did the Israelites come from? When did they show up in Canaan, right? And the conclusion that we came to is that there was um, by around 1200 BC, as attested in the Maranatha Stella that we see uh, up here, that there was an entity uh, in the land of Canaan called Israel living primarily in the highlands, this area you can see highlighted in pink on the slide uh, behind me, right? That uh, how exactly they come to inhabit it and where they come from uh, left us with a few questions, but there's this entity that exists, right, by 1200 BC. We also know that within the next, oh, three, 400 years, 
we will see the emergence of a kingdom, of a state, not just a group of people who are Israelites, but a state that is uh, the politi politically dominant in this region. Uh, and in fact, two states uh, known as Israel. And this is going to show up in the Assyrian text. So sometime between 1200 and about 850, we see the transformation of a people who are roaming the highlands into an organized kingdom recognized by other foreign imperial powers. So how does that happen, right? How does Israel grow from a tribal people occupying these highland era areas to an organized state or kingdom? According to the Bible, this happens by uh, basically forming together a group of tribes into a political organization ruled by a king. They're first going to choose a charismatic leader by the name of Saul, who's eventually going to re be replaced um, by a figure known as David, who is going to establish a royal dynasty that is going to rule at least the southern uh, part of this kingdom for the next uh, uh, four or five hundred years, right, this, this family line. And so our answer according to the Bible is a uh, the establishment of a dynasty that consolidates power, defeats their enemies, conquers those who would oppose them uh, under these uh, two particular uh, figures, mostly David for the conquest and Solomon for the consolidation. A chronological setting then is then the early Iron Age, right? So our Marinette Stella, Israel shows up, happening somewhere around here at the end of the Late Bronze Age. And then around 1000 is BC is the date that we would commonly see associated with a figure like David, uh, Solomon lasting us down into um, mid 10th century. So let's say around uh, 940, 930. Our end point here is going to be the campaign of a pharaoh by the name of Shishak or Shoshank I, who campaigns, uh, he records his campaigns up to uh, into the territory of Israel conquering cities. Uh, this is, according to the Bible, this happens during the reign of Solomon's son, Rehoboam. Uh, according to our Egyptian chronologies, this happens in 925, right? So we're looking at 925 as sort of our cutoff date for the end of this uh, period of David and Solomon, usually between the two of them starting somewhere around 1,000. Right? That's our general chronological setting. So let's look at these particular uh, figures. And so I first will give sort of a brief outline of uh, all too simplified highlights uh, from uh, the life of David, some of which you may be familiar with, some of which will sort of refresh for you. Um, so uh, David is born uh, in the uh, town of Bethlehem to a uh, family household head by the name of Jesse uh, in this town of Bethlehem in the tribe of Judah. So born in the south. Right, the southern part of our uh, geographic area. Uh, at a young age, he becomes part of the emerging royal court under the directorship of Saul, the first king of Israel. Uh, he has varying roles there. Uh, at least one of them is as a uh, harpist or lyre player to soothe the king's evil moods, uh, apparently also as a champion and a hero uh, and a warrior uh, figure. He's eventually going to emerge as a rival and potential usurper to Saul, right? He's going to emerge as a, another popular charismatic figure who has the support of people, particularly in the South, particularly in Judah, who think that um, this Saul guy is not very good and we could do better, right? And we could do better with somebody from our part of town. And this guy, David, seems just the person we need. He's going to gain, gain fame, fortune, and popularity through his military exploits. The one we're most familiar with is his battles with the Philistine hero uh, Goliath, uh, who the Bible records him defeating sing, uh, in single combat. His popularity is going to put him at odds with our uh, King Saul, who is uh, understandably worried about a person that has popular support and general um advocacy as a potential rival claimant. This leads David at a certain point to um, abandon the capital with a group of followers. Um, some would say a group of ne'er-do-wells, uh, but certainly we'll, we will say um, young warriors who have decided to tie their fortune to 
raiding, pillaging, and mercenarying with their popular leader of choice, who happens to be David. They are going to move into the southern desert, which they will set up a base camp where they go and raid and pillage and do mercenary activities, fighting for, uh, according to our biblical text, various Philistine kingdoms, fighting against traditional enemies of Israel, all at the same time sharing the rewards and spoils with the local clans of the south, therefore growing their popularity in that region. All right, so bribing local camp, camp, clan leaders, evading capture by Saul, offering services to sort of the highest bidder. Saul dies. Saul dies in battle with the Philistines, our enemy on the coastal plain that Israel's sort of vying for control with. Um, and this is going to lead to a succession crisis. Everyone in the south says Saul's dead. New king, new charismatic king. This guy, David, looks like an upright dude. Uh, other people say uh, Saul was king. Saul's son should be king after. And so there's uh, this emerges a civil war. Um, Saul's... Uh, Heirs and successors end up getting uh, murdered, eliminated, disappeared, uh, leaving David to consolidate power, in which case he is going to essentially usurp the throne and become king of all of Israel. At which point he uh, starts campaigning and consolidating this rule as a successful military leader, defeating local and foreign enemies. He's going to capture the city of Jerusalem and establish it as the capital of this newfound kingdom. And then he's going to have a number of problems later in life, dealing with, oh, rebellions, particularly in the north, places not from Judah, succession conflicts in his own family. We'll look at this in a little bit more depth. David has numerous wives, which means he has numerous sons. And all of them kind of want to be king. And their mothers kind of want to be queen mother. And uh, uh, this is an infighting scene that is, should be very familiar to us from the broader ancient world. Uh, and certainly one that uh, the Bible says plagues David in his older age as his sons maneuver to uh, succeed him. So what can archaeology tell us about David and his kingdom and this general story? Well, we have a couple main questions that we might want to ask. Can we find evidence of David as this founder of a long-lasting dynasty? All right, that's probably the main claim that the Bible makes, that David is the founder of a long-lived dynasty uh, that is going to last for hundreds of years in southern Israel. Is there evidence for the establishment of an Israelite kingdom in the early Iron II, right around 1000 BC, that would fit with the reign of David? Is there evidence for David's military victories? Is there evidence for his establishment of a capital city in Jerusalem? And do elements of the David story, as we see in the Bible, fit more broadly with how we understand Iron Age culture, Iron Age kingship, Iron Age um, ways of doing uh, politics and battle and life and such things? So these are some of the questions we want to turn to today. The first and most important one is, is there evidence for a Davidic dynasty? And here the answer is um, actually yes. Uh, I've given you so many no answers over the first couple of weeks. It's, it's exciting to actually have a yes answer for this. Uh, we'll start out with the bad news, which is there are no contemporary texts from the Iron 2A, from around the time period where David reigns, that mention David or his exploits. Right? So we have no contemporary texts from the time period. But we do have at least one and probably two texts from later periods that mention um, a Davidic dynasty, right? So these texts, and we'll talk about both of them, we have the Tel Dan Stella and the Mesha uh, Stella. Uh, and so they're coming from sort of this ninth to eighth century. So around uh, sort of this 840 to uh, 750-ish range. So 150 to 200 years after David's reign, we still have mention of the Davidic dynasty. And both of these notably also coming from outside of Israel. The Tel Dan cell is found inside the borders of Israel, but it's an Aramean text. Uh, this is the uh, Meshastella is from Moab, from the territory to the west. And so recognition of David as a dynastic founder from people outside of Israel, from these other uh, extra biblical texts. And so here we have, uh, we'll look first at uh, 
the most important, the Tel Dan Silla, and these mention David in the sense of a house of David, Beit David. Uh, and so house, Beit, is a common term that we see in particularly West Semitic tribal societies, where house of means clan of or larger patrimonial family of a certain individual who's our sort of um, elder, our founding dynast, uh, dynast, right? And so what we see though, is that particularly in Syrian states, Aramean states, that the founding dynast is going to give his name to the kingdom, right? So in this case, Beit David would be another way of saying the kingdom of Israel is the dynasty of David. In fact, we see this in many circumstances. We'll see this uh, eventually after David. Uh, our kingdoms of Israel are going to split a political entity in the north, a political entity in the south. The south will continue to be the house of David, but the north is going to be founded under a new dynast. And our new dynast is someone that the Bible actually doesn't like very much because, well, he doesn't worship God in quite the right way. But his name's Omri. And he's apparently militarily successful, establishes a large kingdom, and when the Assyrians encounter this figure, they talk about his kingdom as the house of Omri, as Beit Omri. Beit Humri, there's an H in there in our uh, Akkadian form, but still the dynasty of Omri, right? So here we see a tradition, and in fact, we can find this when they're referring to uh, Syrian states as well. And so it's a well-established way of talking about a kingdom through its dynastic founder. And so here we have, in this case, uh, an Aramaic uh, Stella, right? Uh, recognizing David as our known founder of this dynasty, even if we don't know much or any information about him, right? This text tells us nothing about David himself other than his dynasty continues to exist. So the Stella itself is found at Tel Dan, a site in the very north of Israel, right? Far north. Um, and it's a victory Stella from an Aramean conquest in the ninth century. The kings of Aram were running their army through Israel, making conquests. We have records of this later in the Bible. Uh, we think this was probably written by uh, one of their more uh, expansive kings, Hazael, written in Aramaic, clearly very broken, right? Uh, I guess if someone puts a victory cell of saying, I won, you lost, ha ha, and then you reconquered the territory, you tend to break it, right? That would be a common response that seems to be what's happening around here. But uh, the, this king, who again is unnamed because the text is broken, uh, claims to have killed Jehoram, son of Ahab, king of Israel, and killed Ahaziahu, son of uh, Je Jehoram, king of the house of David. I set their town into ruins, turned their lands into desolation. Right, so Ahaz and Jehoram are figures that we know of from the biblical text. They're mentioned in our books of kings. Uh, Hazel is a known Aramean uh, king from, again, uh, king of Aram Damascus from later uh, in our ninth century. And so these are all known figures, uh, but here recognizing uh, particularly Ahaz as a ruler from the line of the dynasty of David. Similarly, we have the Mesha Stella, or the Moabite Stone, which is a victory stella erected by King Mesha of Moab. Uh, another figure who is referenced uh, briefly in the Bible, in 2 Kings 2, um, as a figure who liberates the Moabites from Israelite control, as sort of a punishment for their unfaithfulness. Uh, they start losing territories in Moab. And so this uh, artifact dates to about 840 B.C., and it details Mesha's victories over Israelite oppression, oppressors. The language is very familiar to us. Moab sinned. Their god, in this case Chemosh, delivered them over to their enemies who dominated them for a time period. Mesha rose up as a valiant, devout king and sent the enemy packing with help of his god. Uh, the text, as you can see, is very damaged. A lot of this is reconstructed. Um, Unfortunate events surrounding its finding and then its attempts to send in pieces to the antiquities market led to it being um, blown up and uh, partially reconstructed, but a rubbing was taken of it beforehand. So a lot of this is reconstructed based on a rubbing that was taken um, earlier. Uh, 
but it means that the exact nature of what the text says is not entirely clear, but there's a place in line 31 where many scholars reconstruct uh, another king that we can't reconstruct because of things that are broken or it would help, coming from, again, the House of David, similar types of orthography to what we've seen in the um, Keldan Stella, although this, again, is in Moabite, uh, which is very similar to Hebrew, but slightly different. Uh, this has been contested. There are some people that say that's not what is being said here, various other reconstructions. Uh, I still think that House of David is the most likely one. Uh, it seems to make sense given the broader context of the stone and would support what we already see in the Teldan Stella, that foreign countries recognize the dynastic founder to be David. So in that sense, our main claim of the biblical text, that overarching broad sense, that the dynasty, the dynastic kingdom of Israel is founded by a person named David, seems to be supported by our extra biblical texts, even if they tell us nothing else about his life. Which would bring us to the next question then. Is there evidence of the establishment of an Israelite kingdom in the 10th century BC? Here we have a map of the supposed kingdom of um, established by David, right, which is going to unite all these areas in blue under his like Israelite control, and then be extracting sort of tribute from various areas in green, right? And so this would be uh, the kingdom as constructed from our biblical texts, all right? So we suggest a expansive kingdom reaching from the border of Sinai all the way into Syria in the north, and including much of Transjordan. We don't have great evidence for this. We have evidence that at some point a kingdom does emerge. We have evidence that at some point by the ninth century, there are no more Canaanite kingdoms, right? That we have evidence for from later texts. So at some point, something has happened. Uh, the 10th century is as good a time as any uh, for it to happen, but the specific evidence isn't really there. We don't have, for example, any cultural marker that's distinctly Israelite that shows up in the 10th century in areas that it didn't necessarily before. So if David is conquering these areas, it seems to be one of, I'm your boss now, pay me some tribute, and I kind of leave you alone. And the same people are living there, doing the same thing they were doing, paying some money to a um, militarily stronger neighbor. We might call them a bully, um, right? That, 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 that could be happening. And there's no way we'd actually be able to tell that archeologically. And so we really have no evidence for or against any of this relationship. Uh, we do know that kingdoms are founded, ruled by Israelites by the ninth century. So somewhere in this time period, something is happening but it's not going to include these green areas. By the ninth century, they are all independent areas. Uh, and we see even the Moabite stone, though, suggesting that they were at one point paying tribute to Israel, right? That in a previous time, we were controlled, we did pay tribute, we overthrew them. Um, they attribute their subjugation to slightly later than David, uh, but apparently there are multiple rounds of independent subjugation. And so it could have happened multiple times. I want to take a brief excursus here. If there's one thing you may have heard about David or know about David, it's that David kills the giant Goliath, right? And so uh, this is a great story about overcoming uh, significant odds uh, for victory for a specific individual. Um, and so again, it's our best known single action attributed to David. We have our mighty hero, Goliath, best warrior from the Philistine city of Gat, going out and challenging the Israelite army, saying, send anyone you want to come fight me. And the Israelites say, oh no, he big and scary. We're not going to do that. David supposedly visits and says, oh, I got this guy. Uh, and then uh, depending on the version you see, with a little slingshot goes ping, 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 and uh, the giant falls dead. Um, this is probably an oversimplification of the story. Um, Goliath, as described, is a traditional Philistine warrior. Uh, the Philistines, remember, are coming from the Greek world, and Goliath sounds like a Greek warrior. Not quite a hoplite, we're not into that uh, quite Greek sense, but one of these earlier sort of late Bronze Age Mycenaean-style 
uh, warriors and is described as such. But David isn't necessarily the underdog we might make him to be in this story. Um, a slingshot is not a little child's toy that we have here. A slingshot is a dangerous weapon that is employed by multiple armies uh, with whole divisions of them because stones kill people, right? Sling bullets are some of the oldest weaponry that we find. And uh, this is a, David is a very effective warrior at a very certain, uh, certain style of fighting. And so David and Goliath isn't necessarily just a story of big man, small man. It's different fighting styles. Goliath would much rather David be a Saul, have heavy bronze armor and a big spear and a big sword so they could go bash each other. David has no armor because he relies on mobility. I don't let the guy in the big heavy armor get close to me, and I try and kill him from a distance. He has armor. He has a shield. If he gets close to me, I'm dead. If I can evade him and get a good shot in, I'm in good shape, which is what happens. They have different styles of fighting. Goliath knows this and probably much rather fight anyone other than David and his style. And so we have the sort of mocking of David is just trash talk, right? They're trash talking each other. Uh, and it has nothing to do with David actually is a massive underdog here. It's you trash talk your opponent. It's what these types of people do. Uh, and this sort of set, though, of speeches between opponents, single combat, um, heroic uh, individuals. This sounds very Homeric in some senses, right? Uh, sounds like what we see in this Greek world in these Homeric epics. And we're wondering whether this type of single combat is actually reflective of, of a reality. Uh, and that's hard to say. We mostly see it in these heroic type tales. The Bible references it in another passage, 2 Samuel 2. They basically pick heroes from both sides. Ten of them say, go fight. They kill each other, and they're like, well, that accomplished nothing. And then they go fight with the entire armies anyway. Uh, but there's questions whether this is actually a way that combat is done uh, or not. But there are parallels from the, theoretically, late Bronze Age Greek world, if we take Homer seriously. And if this is where the Philistines are coming from, this Aegean world, we might see a tradition for it. But that'd be a very tenuous connection to make. But we have some problems with the Goliath story. And these problems are all textual problems. All right, the textual problems are, we have a bunch of things that don't fit our timeline. So our story of David and Goliath happens in 1 Samuel um, uh, 17. And so at this point, David is like, I'm going to go fight Goliath. And Saul says, who are you? And why are you going to go do that? But in the previous chapter in the biblical text, David's already been appointed as the harpist at Saul's court. Which would seem odd if I'm the person playing my harp for you to soothe you, and you don't know who I am. In fact, in the previous one, he's already mentioned in the previous chapter as a brave warrior. So he's not a, just an inexperienced shepherd in that account. He's already a person of renown attached with the court. And now all of a sudden, Saul's like, who is this guy? In fact, in the same passage, Saul makes a bunch of promises. Whoever kills the giant, I will give them my daughter's hand in marriage. I will make their family taxes exempt. They will be rich. Well, in the next chapter, David gets or Saul gets jealous of David and says, well, I have a plan to kill him. I can't kill him. He's too popular. All of the Philistines kill him. Hey, David, you can marry my daughter. You know what I need? A hundred Philistine foreskins. Have fun. Go get them. Uh, at which point we're saying, but he shouldn't have to supply this type of dowry. It was his reward for beating the giant. So the texts are a little bit at odds. And supposedly David, right, he stuns Goliath with a sling stone. He goes, he takes the giant's own sword, he cuts off his head. And then what does he do? He puts the weapons in his tent and he takes the head back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem at this point is a Jebusite city. David hasn't conquered it yet. It's not a capital. So everything in this story of Goliath is a little bit odd in our general chronology. And so some people have said, well, this sounds like a little bit later folk tale. We have David and we have a mighty warrior, but um, somebody came up with a little bit of uh, an exaggeration. And this may look a little bit more realistic if we start reading other texts from Samuel, and we get to Samuel 21. So wonderful little passage about the, uh, these heroes, these mighty men of valor that accompany David on his uh, various missions. 
And so 1 Samuel 21 records that there's war again with the Philistines at Gob, and Elhanan, the son of Yareoragim, the Bethlehemite, struck down Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Goliath of Gath, isn't this who David was supposed to have killed? And here we have, no, no, Elhanan has done it. Then we have lists of other heroes who have defeated various people with six fingers and six toes, other giants, other Philistine heroes, and our summary statement, all fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So here we clearly see that whoever David's men killed, David also killed, right? He gets credit for all of their types of works uh, in this summary statement. And so this credit may be taken somewhat seriously later, and David is going to be attributed things that maybe he doesn't even kill the giant. The book of Chronicles, which generally resummarizes the events of Samuel and Kings from a later period, uh, written much later, written in the fifth century, right, probably, um, fixes this problem. Right? The editors have gone through and says, um, uh, there was war with the Philistines again. Elhanan, son of uh, Jair, uh, struck down Lachmi, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite. Right? And so we've recognized this and we've added it. But the Chronicles text is later. Right, so this is the type of thing where we might expect them making this type of fix. So it's interesting that the one thing we know about David is one of the things that uh, might be less uh, closely tied to him than some of his other exploits. Goliath, as we said, though, fits in well with some of the data that we know about a warrior from this broader Mycenaean Greek type world. Right? He's a Philistine. He's supposedly ridiculously tall, six cubits and a span. A cubit is your forearm, right? So generally assumed to be about 18 inches. So this would put him at about nine feet, uh, which is very, very tall. Um, but uh, if we ignore that and we look at the other details, bronze helmet, a bronze corslet, um, right? All very heavy, which makes sense. Everything we found of these bronze armor and weapons are very heavy. Uh, we find them in tomb context, particularly in the Greek world. Bronze greaves, a bronze javelin, iron spear, a sword, and some sort of giant shield caught, carried by a shield bearer, something like a tower shield of some kind. Well, here we have a bunch of warriors from a fresco from the Mycenaean Minoan world carrying these giant tower shields and giant spears. Here we have Philistines, Philistine warriors from an Egyptian relief. And you can see them with a spear and a javelin, right? These two throwing weapons. And Goliath supposedly has one of each. You'll see other ones where they have swords then belted across their chest. Here are a big round shield rather than necessarily a tower shield. But these sort of descriptions of the warrior fit what we would expect of somebody, not from a much later period, but generally from around the time of the Iron Age. And so some of Goliath's equipment, the uh, bronze greaves, are again a traditional piece of equipment that we find with these uh, Greek style, Greek world style warriors, which again is the origin of the Philistines coming from this Mycenaean world. Um, and so this may actually fit fairly well. No, oh, sorry about that. Um, all right, our third question is, does David found a mighty capital in Jerusalem? And this too is going to be a difficult question for us. So how would we know about this founding of a major capital? And so there are some things we might look for. Right, so purportedly in our biblical text, David captures a Jebusite city and establishes it as the capital of his kingdom. So what would we expect to look for in capital cities? We would expect public architecture. We would expect monumental architecture, big walls, palaces, eventually temples, but not now because we have an attestation that the temple is going to get built later. And so do we have evidence of a large administrative center, powerful city from the Iron 2A? Answers maybe, right? And there's actually a source of much debate. And so what you're looking at here is a uh, structure that they call the step stone structure. It's in the city of David in Jerusalem, and its dating is uh, difficult. Some people say it's already from the Jebusite city that predates David. Some people say it's later. We have some problems because there isn't much stuff found with it. Well, the problem with Jerusalem is it's continuously occupied, more or less, from the Stone Age through to modern day. 
And it's built on hard bedrock. And there's only so much you can go down and rebuild and reach and uh, reconfigure without destroying what's above it. And it leads to a lot of mixing of materials. So if I have stuff built on bedrock, I might find a lot of material mixed within it, which one defines when this structure was built. So some people say this is part of a Jebusite structure. Some would say this is part of a citadel that might be built as sort of a fortress of the Davidic capital and city. It's certainly a large monumental structure. Whether it dates to David or slightly before is a ongoing debate. With this is another building that in the last 10 years or so has been excavated on top of it that you see in the blue here, right? This blue, there's our stepstone structure in the yellow and going up the slope. And it is leading up to a massive public building, right? We see the walls here very thick. Um, and this building has been described by the excavator, uh, Alant Mazar, as David's palace. She has received a lot of criticism for this particular identification. Um, it is a public building. There's questions about when it actually dates to. Part of the problem is how do we identify the date of a building? We look at the material on the floor of that building. This building has no floors, right? It's just built directly on the bedrock. Everything later has been robbed out. So the exact dating of the building is in question. Does the building relate to the stepstone structure? She argues, yes, they're integrated. Other people say it's not nearly so clear because there's later structures that go on top of it and which stones belong to which wall, what's reused, what's used where. It's a bit of an archeological um, mess. Uh, and so that's led to different opinions. Um, certainly if it is a large public structure, saying it's David's palace, we have no identification that would say that other than it's approximately the right time period. But with more excavation in this area, we do see some larger buildings that seem to be public buildings that could be indicative of a uh, more advanced, higher stratified uh, political entity existing in the region. Uh, the evidence is far from definitive in either direction. This is going to lead us into a bigger problem with identifying David and Solomon within the broader context of the Iron Age. And this is a problem that has to do with archaeological remains and um, radiocarbon dating. And so a traditional account of um, understanding the archaeological material suggests that certain changes that are going on in the Iron early Iron Age are the result of the rise of David and Solomon. So there are some things that we see across Israel in this time period that we'll look at in a minute here. In the highlands in the Iron One, when we first arrived, we were rural, small villages. At some point, these small villages start turning into larger cities. At some point, we start seeing the construction of large fortifications. We start seeing the construction of public buildings. And so scholars early on said, these public buildings, these fortifications, these other structures make sense as part of David's expansion and Solomon's wealth and consolidation. And so they've been traditionally dated to this 10th century period. And in fact, the artifacts there seem to fit this general time frame, and the carbon dates work for that time frame. That's our traditional chronology. That would be what we call our high chronology in this debate. Uh, main advocate for this, Amin Mazar, at the uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, and that basically um, the 10th century is going to be attributed to, uh, we don't know who the kings are there because they're not, uh, they're, it's not clear, but around the time when we would think a David and Solomon would exist. But we admit there's some problems. And the problem is one of the main ways we try and distinguish between layers in archaeology is. Um, people's tastes change. And so different time periods, they use different styles of pottery. The problem is sometimes you have long periods of continuity and the 10th century, the 9th century, they kind of like the same stuff. And so it looks the same. And so when we start looking at the pottery, it's very difficult to distinguish without the right forms. It looks very similar uh, with issues of regionalism, uh, make that even more difficult. Right, uh, we argue that basically, um, by the time we hit Shishak, our, our Egyptian pharaoh, that we have large cities in the highlands that are, he campaigns, he has a list. Well, from Shishak, we have a list of these are the cities I conquer. Some of them are in the highlands. So that means by the time of Shishak, they're 
destroyable, which means they had to be built earlier. Natural result would be David or Solomon. Uh, finally, if we try and tighten the chronology and go lower, uh, that we're going to put too much stuff into too little space, right? That we'd have to have too many occupation layers. Uh, and we say, yes, we renovate our cities, but we don't renovate them every five years, right? That there has to be a little bit more time in between those. And so that's our traditional chronology. So that's Mazar, and he's arguing with uh, Israel Finkelstein of Tel Aviv University, who argues for a different understanding. He says, you know all those buildings that we attribute to Solomon? Unlikely. Finkelstein says there's no evidence that Solomon or David found these large dynasties other than the Bible says so. And what if we don't think the Bible's accurate about this? It says, in fact, we know a period when there are some very expansive rulers that are mentioned in texts outside the Bible, and that's the later 9th, 8th century. That's the Omrides, right? Our beat Humri, who founds our northern dynasty, and says, why don't we attribute all the buildings to this dynasty? that we know is powerful from extra biblical texts. And so everything, because our pottery is similar, that you've been dating to sort of this period of Solomon is actually about 50 to 100 years later. And you can get away with this, right? So it's like David and Solomon probably existed, but the narratives of the Bible are propagandistic. There's no great united empire. There's a marginal chiefdom somewhere in the West. Um, it's not united in either figure, and later uh, for propaganda, uh, a few hundred years later, we have the aggrandization of the early dynasts. Note that as part of this, we're going to read the Meshastella as not referring to a house of David. Uh, we're going to perhaps even reread the Tel Dan Stella to try and say it's not the David referred to here. Um, we're going to shift all of our chronologies down, uh, but the ceramic evidence works with this too. The carbon dates work okay with this too because of uh, irregularities in carbon dating where basically how they have a carbon curve works on a slope, the flatter it is, the uh, more date, the larger a date range it can cover. And so in the iron too, uh, our carbon dates give us a fairly wide date range. And so he just picks one end and Mazar picks the other end. And then there's also some statistical spikes. Uh, it's a fun little game that you play, but basically, um, unless you have really good context, the carbon dating uh, has been increasingly getting the two sides closer together. Um, but this is a still an ongoing debate that says, is there actually archaeological evidence traditionally associated with Solomon? Does it go with his reign or with a later period? Uh, an ongoing question. Right, and so uh, Finkelstein's main uh, point of disagreement is that the Bible is used to understand the archaeology, not the archaeology used to understand itself and then maybe correlate it later. Um, which in many cases is a valid criticism, right? We've seen that criticism uh, in other uh, in other circumstances. But David also fits very well within his broader Iron 2A context, right? So uh, if David is a fabrication of this uh, sixth century, this Persian area propaganda, there are parts of David's life that actually uh, don't work well in a context of later people reading it back and work very well in this situation of a tribal chieftain, right? And so at the uh, Iron 2A and the emergence of the kingdom of Israel, uh, Israel is not the only place that's having an emergent kingdom here. Many Syrian states are emerging under a similar pattern, a powerful clan, uh, with their dynastic leader taking control, uh, these charismatic uh, kings or usurpers, building a power base through basically military success, gift giving, connections, and then uh, strategic marriages. Right? Certainly by the time we get to our later kings and our Josiahs and our Persian period, most of our kings have a one queen, maybe two, right? Uh, and we're, we're, we're in a much uh, slimmed down system. Uh, David and Solomon, Solomon most notoriously, are not following that system. And they're following a system that fits earlier, which is a, um, I need to make tribal alliances. The best way to do that is marrying well. And David, in fact, marries well, right? Uh, here's a record of people that he uh, he marries. Uh, first one would be Michael, daughter of Saul. So he has a connection to the existing ruling, ruling family, which means he can claim that he's not really a usurper, right? He's a legitimate uh, connection to the pre-existing royal family. 
He's going to marry uh, Abigail of Carmel. Carmel is a nice region up in the north. Although there are some people that argue that that Carmel is actually in the south, but there's not a lot of evidence for that, so we won't get into it too much. He marries Ahinoam of Jezreel. Jezreel is our fertile farmland and our major uh, east-west pass that runs across the middle of the country. One of the most strategically important areas, one of the most agriculturally productive ones. He marries Maka, daughter of Talmai, king of Gesher. Gesher is our kingdom up here. It's Israel's closer neighbor, closest neighbor to the north. It's the buffer between uh, Israel and sort of these Aramean other states. Very useful alliance to have. He's going to marry Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah the Hittite. Not a very useful one to have. We'll get back to that in a minute. And then we have other wives listed, Hagit, Avital, Egla, but it doesn't tell us anything about their particular relationships other than they bear him children. Oh, but we can see that David is um, making a number of alliances, and the ones that we have indicate that he's strategically, from his home territory, connecting to other strategic areas in the country. Right, so this is going to be a good move for David that fits in with this broader tribal chieftain uh, type system. Well, we might note on the side that we may find the inconvenience that many of the people he marries have their husbands conveniently die, and he marries them after. And so that's the case with Abigail. That's going to be the case with uh, Bathsheba, who, again, uh, is our sort of other famous uh, story of David. He catches her taking a bath has relations with her, gets her pregnant, so gets her husband killed, uh, and gets himself in a little bit of trouble for that one. And in fact, we'll see a lot of trouble for that one uh, in, in, a, in a minute here. So that's sort of another feature of David that fits well. We have other features that are um, we can also place in the Iron Age context. And one is uh, David and Solomon are recorded as having relations with another northern neighbor, which is the city of Tyre in Phoenicia. And so apparently Tyre is, uh, a king Hiram of Tyre, is an ally of David, and the uh, Phoenicians are known as craftsmen. They are good at building boats, they are trade people, they are uh, skilled craft workers, and they also have something that everybody wants, which is cedar, nice wood, right, for building big temples and palaces. And so apparently when David comes to uh, power, he goes and sends messages to Hiram, uh, king of Tyre, asking for cedar trees, carpenters, and stonemasons. In fact, his son Solomon is going to do the same thing. It's time to build a temple. What do I do? I go and I ask for cedars and cypress, and I'm going to trade you lots of food and oil. Which, in fact, makes a lot of sense. Phoenicia is a coastal city that relies on trade. They actually don't have a lot of farmland, so getting a lot of farm produce from uh, a southern neighbor would be very con convenient for them. This Hiram of Tyre is an interesting figure for us. We have a King Hiram of Tyre attested, uh, but not at the right time period. Right, so our letters of Tiglath place are the third, a Assyrian king in the eighth century, around 745 to 730 ish, uh, for this Hiram of Tyre, uh, records this king. And in fact, we have bowls from Cyprus that have um, inscriptions on them that mention a Hiram of Tyre. Well, some people read this and say, well, this is evidence that our Hiram of Tyre relationships are outdated, anachronistic, that Hiram of Tyre is an 8th century figure, and so these texts don't fit in to a 10th century context. Uh, but we have another argument that says, what if there are two kings of a dynasty with the same name? Who would ever think that there would be multiple Edwards that could possibly be king of England, right? Um, so if we, do we just have a popular dynastic name? In fact, we have evidence that this might be the case. Right, and so um, we have an earlier mention of a uh, Hiram of Tyre from an interesting source. And here we're going to go to the Roman historian Josephus. So we're going to first century CE, so much later. But he's telling a history of um, his history of the Jews, and he's reconstructing some of this ancient history, and he's relying on the history of Tyre on a certain figure, uh, a historian by the name of Menander who supposedly has access to the royal Tyrian um, archives. And Menander has a list of Tyrian kings that Josephus uses. The list is compiled at a later date, but this list has two Hirams on it. It has one in the 8th century where it belongs, and it has one much earlier, around the 10th century. The thing about Menander, though, is 
everything else on his list, or not everything, but multiple things on his list from this earlier period, check out with other Mesopotamian sources. So it's not just the Hiram's. He mentions other kings that it does check out with that make us think that Menander has pretty good information. That even though the text comes later, Menander recognizes two uh, Hiram's, and so that in fact our Hiram of Tyre in the 10th century would fit well with not a 6th century rewriting, retelling of these stories, but an original um, 10th century uh, political type encounter. So that gets us through David, right? Uh, so we have evidence of him as a dynastic founder. His other uh, exploits are hard to pin down. Some of them certainly seeming to be a little bit legendary, uh, others fitting with the time period. David is going to hand the uh, kingdom over to his son, Solomon. Solomon is going to be a, uh, hey, whoa, I have lost my, no, I do not want to shut down the system. I would, I would very much not like to shut down the system. I will. Now it needs to warm up. So um, we'll keep talking a little bit while we, while we bring this back. Um, but Solomon is going to take over from David. And so Solomon is going to have some problems. And the first problem we have is that um, I'm still waiting for my system to warm up. Here we go. So now we're going to go center. Boom. And we are back in business. Uh, and if you're watching on YouTube, you didn't even know we were down because you're just looking at my screen. Uh, all right. So Solomon is the son of Bathsheba. And this is a problem. It's a problem because Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah the Hittite and has none of the right political connections. And so when her son becomes king, is not tying into any of the alliances that David already made. And so losing some uh, connections is eventually going to lead to rebellion in the north. Right? But he's going to follow, uh, succeed David following a succession crisis. Uh, succession crisis, again, marking sort of the latter part of David's reign, particularly where the northern tribes are going to try to rebel, follow the sons of his northern wives, particularly Absalom, who is the son of Maka, the daughter of the uh, king of Geshur, right? As this part of this, northern tribes are going to ally around their uh, potential successors against David. But Solomon is known for his massive building programs and administrative reforms. Supposedly rules our largest sort of extent of the kingdom. Extensive commercial networks with Phoenicia and Arabia. Uh, and extensive use of marriage alliances. Remember, uh, he's our uh, one of the hundreds of wives and hundreds more concubines. right? And so again, this idea of cementing uh, Relationships through marriage alliances, how much of this is later exaggeration, uh, potentially a considerable amount, but even 15 would be enough to make uh, right, right, uh, a substantial amount of uh, connectivity between local tribes. But Solomon, one of the things he's known for is building projects, right? So 1 Kings 4 talks about the stalls, horses, and chariots he has. It talks about the forced labor to build um, the temple, to build his palace, to build walls of various cities, Jerusalem, Hatzor, Megiddo. In fact, from around the 10th century, or if you want the low chronology, you'll push this to the 9th century, which is where this starts becoming a problem, non-Solomonic at that point, you start seeing construction at major urban sites. We have large pillared buildings that have at times been uh, uh, identified as stables, although that's problematic, uh, but they are large public buildings, like this one at Megiddo. We have large gate structures showing up at Hatsor, Megiddo, Gezer, a number of other cities as well. But there we have Hatsor, Megiddo, Gezer, and Makish uh, being shown. All right, and so in fact, we start seeing this map here. You can start seeing um, places with fortifications, casemate walls, gates associated with Solomon in the red, places with these large public buildings in the gray, right? And so again, uh, low chronology would associate all these with a later period going into a uh, period after Solomon, but others would say that they go better with this period. So part of an extensive building program. Right, and this is going to uh, primarily be these gates, primarily these six chambered fortified gates um, that we see at a number of Iron Two sites. Again, primary ones at Hatsor, Megiddo, and Gezer, but these are not the only ones. Um, they show up at a number of different ones, but these are the ones mentioned in 1 Kings 9. 
get plans of those particular ones. And you can see similarity type of construction. So people have said uh, a kingdom, a top-down sort of building program is uh, mandating for these types of constructions because of their uniformity. Again, you can still have disagreements on who that top-down authority is. We also see fortification walls, a major uh, type of wall that's emerging here that we call a casemate. Uh, your best example is right here. And you can see two walls with a little gap in between. So you can sort of have a house in between there or something else. But it's kind of like a two wall type system. Uh, and we find these at, again, many of the same sites, uh, Hot Sword, uh, down south of Beersheba, small um, fortress sites in the uh, hill, uh, lower lower hill foothills, uh, like um, uh, Kibbeh Kaafa. Right, and so we see these types of ideas in First Kings nine again. Right, Solomon rebuilding some of these cities, um, and then again using them as store cities, military uh, jumping points. We have these pillared buildings. They all look different. I have lots of them: two rows of pillars, three parts. Uh, we have lots of interpretations. Are they stables? Are they storehouses? Are they uh, public marketplaces? Uh, the answer is probably different things in different places. And we don't need one general use for all of them, but they're public buildings. And so we have a public institution, right? A palace and administration that needs public spaces for storing things or housing things or moving things, right? Warehouses, uh, who knows, right? But the state needs buildings, right? And we can see that our state today has lots of different um, buildings. And so... Um, uh, again, thinking about public type uh, structures, this seems to be one of them. They show up in the 10th century, again, around when we'd say Solomon uh, and David would be around, and they continue to be used throughout the period of uh, Israelite occupation down into the 7th century. The most famous building we're associated with is the temple. Right, Solomon uh, most notably builds the temple. We can see two reconstructions here. We obviously don't have archaeological evidence for the temple because uh, its existence would be on the Temple Mount, which is currently the Haram al-Sharif, one of the most sacred sites in Islam, right? It also would have been extensively remodeled. It gets rebuilt in the Herodian period, the Jewish temple is uh, sort of the, the so-called second temple. Uh, the wall, outer walls of that precinct of which still exist, that would be the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall within Judaism, right? It's part of that later construction. So we're not sure what would exist of this earlier construction, but we have traditions of certainly this is a holy place where things are still built, even if we can't and really shouldn't uh, be doing any excavation there. But we do have descriptions of this temple, right? And so we have descriptions in First Kings about its size, its length, its width, its, uh, its general structure. And what we see is a building that is tripartite in nature, right? We have sort of a forecourt, we have an open court, we have sort of a back cella or holy of holies type area, pillars on the outside, steps going up, lots of fun um, decorations, but this longer than it is broad type, uh, th tripartite temple. This long room plan temple is something that we know from the ancient world. Here I have examples from, uh, second uh, into second millennium into first millennium from Syria of a style of temple that is again, long room, right? Uh, various organizations, but tripartite three in number, uh, slightly different from some of our sort of Greek style temples here. But so we have parallels across the region, most notably ones we'll look at in a second at Tainat and Andara. And in fact, we see if we look at the sizes of the ones we've excavated, they're well within the range of the sizes that were dictated in Kings for Solomon's temple. So they may be aggrandized, they may not be, but they're well within range of large temples that we see from the um, Bronze and Iron Age. In fact, here, let's look at some plans. This is, again, the plan that we were looking at before of a reconstruction based on the text of what we think Solomon's temple would generally sort of have looked like. Here's where one from Endara. Stairs, pillars, front room, second room, platform in the back that's kind of like our other cella. Here we have, again, porch, middle room, back room in our temple at Tainat. In fact, Indar is probably one of our best parallels. It's an Iron Age temple from Syria, um, actually notably damaged in um, some of the um, conflict that was going on um, in, uh, in that region fairly recently, which is a large disappointment. Uh, it's a fun temple uh, for some god, 
the God, uh, notably, well, the most famous thing is it has footprints outside of the God entering. So you have it here, then you have one there, and the next footprint way in the middle, because gods are huge. You can see the little comparison of, of the feet sizes there. Um, not a parallel to the Israelite temple, but just really fun, so I had to show you. Um, but it it's then has this outline of this temple, and the, it's elaborately decorated. And it's hard to see here, but I'll show you close-ups. These are all carved orthostats. They're stones with carvings of various uh, animals and mythological creatures on them. And this brings us to just a general question of the decoration of Solomon's temple. Right? So we have a description of the temple. We have descriptions of other things that go along with it. We have pillars, bronze pillars that they name um, that they name that are sitting uh, outside of it, right? Yakin and Boaz. Uh, and there are these pillars, and we have described the capitals on them, capitals of molten bronze, um, right? Five cubits tall. They are decorated, tops with pomegranates and other sorts of things. In fact, we have found, not in bronze, but uh, capitals, right? Capitals are the tops of these pillars that are similar to the descriptions of what we might have here that we can see reconstructed. We have uh, pictures of shrines that are also have these pillars outside with similar type decorations. So the description of Solomon's temple fits well with temple designs, temple architecture from the early Iron Age. Here again, we have pictures of the Andara temple, right? Our sphinxes and our lions and other things. But let's read the description of Solomon's temple. That he carved all the walls of the house round with carved engravings of cherubim, palm trees, open flowers, inner outer sanctuaries, overlaid with gold, right? Carving again, cherubim, uh, trees, flowers, right? So this is what we have at Andara. The entire outside is carved with these types of figures. Uh, for the inside, we have inlays. These are, again, from palaces and other places, but inlays of uh, cherubs, of rosettes, right? Flowers, palmettes. These are common types of decorations we find in palace and temple type settings. And so they fit very well for the description of Solomon's temple. We have very accessory accessories, right? Uh, Kings is recording all the accessories made for the temple. We made 10 bronze stands, length of each four cubits, width four cubits. Uh, here's the design. Their borders between the frames were lions, oxen, and cherubim. We were framed with Carvables showing up on the interior, right? Uh, they had four bronze wheels, one, two, three, four, like chariot wheels, right? We see examples there from Ekron. Uh, these stands are from Cyprus, right? But we still have from the ancient world these types of things. And so the description of the temple ornaments are fitting for what we might see of this time period. So our description of Solomon's temple seems to fit very well with an early Iron Age type uh, setting, and we can find parallels for many of the things described in it, right? We can find parallels from either descriptions of ancient temples or artifacts found in those areas. Last story of Solomon we want to go into. One of our, uh, perhaps, uh, again, Solomon's sort of renowned for his wisdom, and one of our uh, major anecdotes of this is he's visited from the Queen of Sheba, a queen from far away, hears about his wisdom. She comes to visit him, to test him with a very large car caravan of camels carrying spices, gold, and precious stone. This is an interesting text for us. And one of the things is, uh, so Sheba, as far as uh, we know if I know the text, is the ancient kingdom of Saba. Saba is a known kingdom in modern Yemen, right? It's down in here. And uh, during the 8th century, a little bit later, they are the major export of certain spices, notably frankincense and myrrh, right? Since we're getting to Christmas season, uh, our gifts of the wise men are actually all things coming from the spice routes and from Saba. Uh, gold is actually very popular in this area of Arabia as well. Uh, but myrrh and frankincense are actually more expensive. They're very sought after uh, spices. The origins of the spice trade is an uh, issue of fairly considerable debate. Uh, if Solomon is engaging with it, it would be one of the earliest um, encounters that we have with the Arabian spice trade. We're only starting to get domestic camels in uh, Israel at this period. Uh, about 200 years earlier, we see our first examples. But we know of Saba, and we have it mentioned in our biblical prophets fairly frequently. So Ezekiel uh, mentions the merchants of Sheba and Ramah. Uh, choices, spices, precious stones, and gold. 
Isaiah mentions, right, people coming from Sheba, bringing gold and frankincense. So this is an area that is well known for the types of goods and material that Solomon is collecting. And it would be in line with an early encounter of that trade. We have evidence of that trade showing up in other texts uh, in Assyria from uh, about 150 years later. One more interesting feature on this is he's speaking with the queen of Sheba which is an interesting figure to be sort of our political leader, right? We have a tradition and we a uh, very patriarchal tradition in the Bible. So why do we have a queen of Sheba as their major representative? But in fact, this is going to fit with some other um, traditions we have dealing with Arabia. When the Assyrians encounter the Arabs in sort of uh, their early encounters, the people they encounter, the political leaders are the queens of the Arabs. There's a Samsi, the queen of the Arabs. There's a Zabibe, the queen of the Arabs. And so there's a tradition in Arabia of matriarchal rule. There are also examples of kings. We have texts from some of the kingdoms down here that have them, so it's not exclusive. But this idea of a queen uh, of a peoples in Arabia. Uh, and in fact, we have a much earlier Egyptian text from the new kingdom of the reign of Hatshepsut, who's going to get frankincense. She's going to get from the pseudo-mythical land of Punt, which we think is sort of Somalia, Ethiopia down here. And um, who do they interact with there? The Queen of Punt. And so again, some of these other areas in this particular region have some tradition of prominent queens. And so again, this sort of reference in the biblical text might be indicative of some of this type of knowledge. All of this has to be over by 925. Right, our chronological linchpin for the end of our Davidic Solomonic era is uh, Shoshank, uh, our Egyptian pharaoh from the third intermediate period, Dynasty 21, generally dated around 925. He records a campaign against um, cities. He doesn't name kingdoms. So he doesn't say against the kingdom of Israel or Judah. He says, I conquered cities. And he gives a list. This is the list of cities. And you can see they're just sort of these stylized name of a city with a prisoner sort of shown above them. Uh, but these cities generally follow places in this map. So places in the south, places in the north. He goes and runs through and does these conquests. And in fact, this um, interaction is recorded during the reign of Rehoboam in 1 Kings 14. Uh, Rehoboam being the son and uh, successor to Solomon. And so this is sort of what we're going to see as our cutoff point. So anything we're looking at is happening before 925 and sometime after sort of our arrival of the Israelites in the land. Uh, so that's sort of what we're looking at for our range. And so as we get into this period, what we're seeing is uh, a number of closer connection points, right? We have a name. David's one of these first names that I have in the Bible that I can go place in an extra biblical source, even if it's slightly later, not referring to him. Uh, the character directly. I'm starting to see other cultural and connective parallels uh, that are going to be part of this formation of the state of Israel. As we get into the successors in this uh, sort of uh, period of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, I'm going to start getting more and more names of people I can identify and these connection points that I can draw across uh, from these sort of historical accounts of the Bible. And that's all I have for you. So thank you again for uh, coming and uh, hope you all have a wonderful holiday season.